What do you think the concentration of glucose in, in the cells is? Do you think it's high or low in general? Low. Why? No, in normal conditions, what, what do you think the concentration of glucose in blood is? So if a molecule of glucose gets inside the cell, what do you think it happens? Oh, it turns into something else. Right, it turns into something else. We break it down basically to use to use it for energy or we can store it. But in any case, this is no longer glucose. It would be something else. So the concentration of glucose in the blood, sorry, in the cells, at any given time is going to be low, right? After a meal, we have a very high concentration of glucose in the blood vessels. So what do you think is going to happen with glucose? Glucose is going to want to move to the cells, right? Because the concentration is higher here than here, right? And the concentration is low here too. So glucose wants to move from the blood vessels to the extracellular fluid first. And then whatever this glucose moves to the extracellular fluid, now the concentration of glucose in the extracellular fluid is large, the concentration of glucose in the cells is small, so glucose wants to move to into the cell. So this process of movement of molecules in which molecules move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration, we call it diffusion, right? So Glucose wants to move from the extracellular fluid to the, in, to the uh, intracellular fluid, okay? Inside the cell. Do you think that glucose can move inside the cell like this? Like, okay, so there's a high concentration here, so let's move inside the cell. What were the three kinds of diffusion that we talked about? Facilitated diffusion. What else? You have to know this by now. I mean, if you cannot answer me, yeah, I, I don't know. Don't, this is going to be in the exam again, in, in exam two, which, by the way, is going to be next week. But I'll send you an email about that. What are the, the two other kinds of diffusion? Diffusion through the lipid bilayer, diffusion through protein channels. What are the characteristics? What are the differences between those three? So why do we distinguish three kinds of diffusion? It, it should be because they are different, right? There are different ways of transporting molecules or because there is something different about the different molecules. Can glucose move through the lipid bilayer? No. No, why? Because the lipid bilayer is like polar and nonpolar, and it can only get through like one part and then it gets stuck at the other part. So glucose is polar, a polar molecule, right? And it cannot cross the nonpolar lipid bilayer. So to make glucose cross the lipid bilayer, what do we need? Proteins. Proteins, right? So you need proteins, you need to put something there that is polar, or at least it has some region that is polar. So this is why we have proteins in the plasma membrane, because if we didn't have proteins, all the polar molecules could not cross the lipid bilayer, and we need lots of low polar molecules. Now, there are two kinds of diffusion that use proteins, right? The other two kinds. So diffusion through ion channels, and facilitated diffusion. Is glucose an ion? No, how do you know that? It doesn't have charge, and if ions are elements, okay? They are not, I mean, they are not molecules, really. So that's an ion, right? Well, you can have ions that are molecules, but usually they are small, and they are charged, basically. Glucose is not charged, so, and also it's really big, so you cannot, use an ion channel to move glucose, right? So what is left? Facilitated diffusion. What, what were the characteristics of facilitated diffusion? What differentiates facilitated diffusion from the other two kinds of diffusion? 
energy, well, diffusion uses energy in general? No. So the three kinds of diffusion in, in no, no case, diffusion uses energy. So if you need to use energy to move a molecule, then that's not diffusion, it's uh, active transfer. Ion channels are proteins, right? Yeah. So. so, when you have an ion channel, so it's protein that is something like this, it's kind of like a gate, and then it opens or closes, and then the ions move using diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is a bit different, so you have a protein that actually recognizes the molecule that needs to be moved, in this case glucose, and whenever glucose binds the protein, the protein changes the conformation, right? And then it releases the, the molecule. To the other side, right? That might seem a tiny difference, so okay, so what? So instead of a channel, it does something like this. So it takes a molecule of glucose and then it throws it inside the cell. This tiny difference has an important consequence, which is saturation, okay? Remember that these, when these channels open, lots of ions can move in and out and you don't reach saturation. You can move lots of ions using that. When you use this, you need to move one molecule of glucose at a time. This takes time, so whenever you have lots of glucose here, the system kind of saturates, and then there is only that amount of glucose that you put into the cell per uh, unit time, right? Okay. There is going to be a question in the exam about movement of molecules across membranes, because I don't think that you still maybe you understand it, but I want you to study it and to have all these things like Okay. Uh, Alright, so then if we want uh, glucose to diffuse inside the cells, we need um, we need to use facilitated diffusion. To use facilitated diffusion, we need proteins in the plasma membrane that are able to recognize glucose, bring glucose inside the cell, all right? Well, it turns out that we have these proteins, but these proteins, when the cell is not uh, in need of uh, getting glucose, these proteins are inside the cell. They are not in the plasma membrane. They are in vesicles. These vesicles, they have a membrane also, and the composition of the membrane of the vesicles is exactly the same as the composition of the plasma membrane. So what you have is vesicles here. And these vesicles are going to have these proteins. All right? But they are located inside the cell. the plasma membrane and these proteins that are going to allow glucose to diffuse, they are inside the cell. So what does this mean? If the proteins are here and not here, this means that glucose cannot get inside the cell, right? There is a reason for that because you, if, if glucose is allowed to diffuse, then there is going to be a point at which the concentration of glucose in blood is going to be really low, right? Because the cells will take all this glucose. The concentration of glucose in the cells is going to be kind of high. That can create some problems, like osmotic problems. Yeah. 
I don't know, there, there are some tissues that can only use glucose, but most tissues can, uh, can use glucose and fatty acids as a source of energy, and we need to switch from one to the other, and we'll talk about this in a few weeks. So there is a reason to keep uptake of glucose strictly controlled in the cells, all right? So the point is that you have the, the proteins that allow facilitated diffusion inside the cell. So this means that the cells, while the, the proteins are inside, the cells cannot take glucose, right? So how do the cells know that they need to take glucose, that there is glucose around and they need to take glucose? Well, insulin is the signal that they wait, that they are waiting for. So remember that we start secreting insulin whenever there is food in the small intestine. Remember that the small intestine uh, secretes this uh, GIP, glucose insulinotropic peptide. There are also other avenues, and we'll talk about them today. So the, the body knows that there is a high concentration of glucose in the blood, all right? Because we have been absorbing glucose, and that happens particularly after a meal, right? So whenever there is a high concentration of glucose in the blood, insulin production is stimulated. And which is the organ that produces insulin? The pancreas specifically. Remember they have two, two compartments? The endocrine pancreas is in charge of secreting insulin. So in response to a high concentration of glucose in the blood, the endocrine, endocrine pancreas is going to secrete insulin. And now you have insulin in the blood too, because insulin is a hormone. The endocrine pancreas is going to produce insulin and it's going to secrete insulin into the blood vessels, okay? It's an endocrine gland. So now you're gonna have insulin in the blood vessels too. Now the concentration of insulin is a protein, by the way. The concentration of insulin in the blood now is higher than the concentration of insulin in the extracellular fluid, right? So what do you think insulin is gonna do? Insulin is going to diffuse from the blood vessels to to the extracellular fluid. Now you have insulin and glucose in the extracellular fluid. Now, I said that insulin is a protein, so do you think that insulin is going to get into the cell? So now the concentration of insulin is higher in the extracellular fluid than in the intracellular fluid, right? So insulin wants to get inside the cell, so it will try to do that using diffusion because it's the easiest way if you don't spend energy, okay? And so do you think insulin can move via diffusion inside the cell? No? Why? Yeah. I guess. Because I guess. You guess? Okay. So every time you guess, you have to tell me the reason why you guess what you guess. So insulin is a protein. We have three kinds of diffusion. Do you think that insulin can move through the lipid bilayer via diffusion through the lipid bilayer? No. Do you think it can move through ion channels? No. Do you think it can move through facilitated diffusion? Does it have the right protein channel, right? It, perfect. So if it has, we don't call them channels though, but if it has the, the right transporter, is how we call these proteins. Channels is for ions. If, if you have the right transporter, you can move insulin into the cell using facilitated diffusion, but we don't have them. So insulin is stuck here. What, what we have though is a protein in the plasma membrane that can recognize insulin. So I'm going to use covers, I guess. So let's Insulin is going to be orange. And glucose 
those are not transporters. So these molecules can recognize insulin, so insulin can bind to these proteins, but they are not transporters. So whenever there is recognition of insulin by these proteins, nothing is gonna happen. Well, I mean, insulin is not going to go inside the cell. Lots of things are gonna happen, and we are gonna talk about them now. We call these proteins receptors, protein receptors. And I'm sorry because now you have heard the word receptor many times, and it means a different thing all the time. So a sensory receptor is a cell, okay, or a group of cells. A protein receptor is not a cell. It's a protein located in the plasma membrane of cells, all right? So protein receptors can recognize insulin, and then they bind to insulin, right? Insulin binds to them, actually, because these, the protein receptors, they don't move, they are in the plasma membrane. Here you have this protein receptor here, and you can see that insulin can recognize and bind to this insulin receptor. Usually these receptors, they sometimes they have like weird names, I don't know, letters and numbers, it depends on, there are thousands of them, so each one of them has a, a name. Um, those are called insulin receptors because they specifically recognize insulin. They don't recognize anything else, right? So when insulin is recognized by these receptors, insulin doesn't go into the cell, okay? Insulin always stays out of the cell, but this recognition triggers a series of biochemical reactions, all right? Which I'm not going to detail here, but that's not the point. But whenever this recognition happens, there are going to be biochemical reactions going on, all right? And these biochemical reactions, what they are going to produce is to stimulate the movement of these vesicles towards the plasma membrane. These vesicles that have the glucose transporters. Okay? So remember you have the glucose transporters inside the cell in vesicles. Whenever there is recognition of the insulin by the protein receptor, then you are going to stimulate the movement of these vesicles towards the plasma membrane. When you move these vesicles towards the plasma membrane, these vesicles, they are surrounded by a membrane whose composition is identical to the plasma membrane. So whenever these things get really close to the plasma membrane, you're gonna have phospholipids and phospholipids. They like each other. They have these non-polar tails. And then these vesicles are going to fuse with the plasma membrane, okay? So you're gonna have something like that, okay? And then Whenever this moves towards the plasma membrane, there is a point at which you're gonna have something like this. And whenever you get something like that, the vesicle is going to fuse with the plasma membrane, right? Now, this vesicle has the Glucose transporters, which I'm going to draw in green to be consistent with. All right, so you have the glucose transporters here. And you can see that whenever the membranes fuse, the glucose transporters, they don't go anywhere, so they are still gonna be here, right? And after the fusion occurs, what happens? You see that? After the fusion is produced, what happens? Now the glucose transporters are in the plasma membrane, right? So that's what you have illustrated here. You have a vesicle with glucose transporters. The vesicle moves 
towards the plasma membrane, stimulated by the recognition of uh, insulin by the insulin uh, receptor. And then once the vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane, you already have the protein, sorry, the glucose transporters embedded in the plasma membrane. And now you still have a high concentration of glucose in the intra, inter extracellular fluid, sorry. And now what's gonna happen? Now glucose can diffuse inside the cell, right? Using these transporters. So you have brought glucose into the cell using facilitated diffusion, right? Notice that if you don't have insulin, the vesicles are going to remain in, inside the cell. So if you don't have insulin, you can have a super high concentration of glucose in the blood that the cell is not going to notice. The cell is not going to notice that there is a really high concentration of glucose in the blood. The cell cannot incorporate glucose and eventually it's gonna run out of energy and when you don't have energy in your cells, you will die. Okay? After diffusion of glucose has occurred, you can see that this region where the transporters are located goes back into the cell, right? So there is the, the membrane is kind of pinched, and then you form a vesicle, and in this case, the vesicle is moved inside the cell, right? And many of these vesicles are gonna fuse in an organelle that is called endosome, but you can still see that there are like um, the glucose transporters are located there. And the endosomes are going to remain inside the cell until we, until what? Insulin. Until insulin is secreted again. So until your next meal, probably, right? And then the process starts again, right? Is that clear? Do you have any questions? So, there are people, unfortunately, that cannot produce insulin, right? This is what happens in diabetes. So, if you cannot produce insulin, so there are two kinds of diabetes, right? You all know this, or you know that there is diabetes type one, diabetes type two. Diabetes type one is an autoimmune this means that your own immune system attacks the beta cells of the pancreas, which are the ones that are in charge of producing insulin, and then you lose the ability to produce insulin, and when that happens, you can see that you are in big trouble. Fortunately, these people, they can get like artificial insulin, and then it's not a problem, right? Diabetes type two is a different kind of thing, so it can lead to stop the production of insulin, okay, if it's sustained over time. But uh, with diabetes type two, what happens is that you um, increase resistance to insulin, right? So this means that you secrete insulin a lot, so a diabetes type two is usually associated with obesity, right? So if you eat a lot all the time, what's gonna happen? You're going to secrete insulin all the time because you're all the time absorbing things, right? So then this means that your pancreas is going to produce insulin pretty much all the time. This means that you're gonna have insulin in your blood pretty much all the time. So these receptors, they're going to be kind of overstimulated. So this is like if I close the door now. If the door is closed, which is almost, okay? So, and this is what, the sixth week of the semester? Has anybody knocked the door ever since we meet in this class? Never, right? So if now we have the door closed and somebody knocks, everybody's gonna pay attention because it's a very unusual thing, right? And then probably I'm going to go there and see who is knocking and what do you want, right? If 
that starts happening like all the time, there is going to be a point at which if it happens every five minutes, nobody's gonna pay attention because it's like, okay, whatever. It would be kind of like white noise. It's like, I don't know, cars going in the street or something like that. So you get less sensitive to the stimulus, right? So as if you have insulin in the blood all the time, then the protein receptors are like, okay, oh, insulin again, whatever. So the cells become less sensitive to the presence of insulin, okay? And then eventually they can get like, they can get a super low sensitivity. So no matter how much insulin you produce, the cells are not going to respond at all, all right? And then they're not going to uptake glucose and then you have the same result as if, as if you have diabetes type one, but through a different mechanism, right? Your pancreas also works much harder so that can lead to the beta cells in the pancreas to say, okay, I'll quit, I'm done. And then you can stop producing insulin if this is a situation sustained over time. And then you have, you don't have insulin, so it's the same problem, right? But through a different mechanism. Do you understand this? All right, so you can see that to explain how we get glucose inside the cell, you need to know the structure of the plasma membrane, the different kinds of movements of molecules through the plasma membrane, right? So how diffusion works, you need to understand the difference between concentrations and amounts, all these things that we covered the first three weeks that maybe you thought, okay, I don't know what this has to do with anything. So all these things are coming up and this is why I emphasize the importance of you understanding the first three weeks, the materials of the first three weeks. Because you can see that if you don't understand that, you don't understand how molecules move across membranes, you are not going to understand this, okay? All right. Everybody good? Good. So, that has to do with carbohydrates, okay? So we break them down basically into glucose, there are other molecules, okay? Other molecules of carbohydrate that uh, we absorb, fructose, galactose, I don't know, different things. And they follow a very similar pathway. So this is why I only explain uh, glucose, because it's probably the most important. And also the storage. Glycogen uh, is formed by molecules of glucose attached to each other. So if you want to store the molecules of fructose, you have to convert them into glucose first, okay? So that's why I thought that if I explain glucose, then pretty much you're gonna understand every other monosaccharides, how we absorb them and we use them, all right? So another thing that we absorb is uh, fat, triacylglycerols. And remember that I told you that uh, triacyl glycerols are molecules that are formed by a molecule of glycerol and free fatty acids. Triacyl glycerols are lipids, so they are, those, these lipids are non-polar, all right? And when you see the fate of triacyl glycerols, uh, you can see that they go straight to the adipose tissue. So those are lipids, they are non-polar, so this means that they can cross the lipid bilayer, all right? And uh, they will, after we eat, our, the concentration of triglycerides in the blood increases a lot. And what we're going to do with triglycerides, we can do two things. With 
triglycerides, we can use them for energy, and we can store them in the form of fat, all right? The, the source of energy that we, so when, whenever you need energy now, the first thing that you're going to do is to use your carbohydrates, glycogen or the glucose that you have in the blood. So the triglycerides, in general, they are never going to be used as a source of energy right away. So in the, the, the first, at the onset of physical activity, for example, so when you work out, the first few minutes, you're going to use glucose. And then after that, you, most of the tissues in your body, they're going to switch to triglycerides, all right? So we are not really going to use triglycerides for energy right away, and this is, a, this is why pretty much all the triglycerides that we absorb after a meal, they go straight to the adipose tissue to be stored, okay? Here you have a picture in which it shows the process of absorption of the triglycerol. So um, you have triglycerols in the small intestine, and this needs to go to the blood vessels. And eventually it's going to go to the blood vessels, but actually triglycerols, they're going to use an, in, an intermediate. Uh, how can I incorporate that? So I'm going to raise. start with the triglycerols in the small intestine, right? They are ready to be absorbed. And when we eat, when we, we have this, uh, we fat and pretty much there are lots of food items that contain some amount of fat, right? So the fat um, is uh, in the form of big fat droplets. And we need so, although this is a non-polar structure, you can see that this fat droplet is as big as this cell. So obviously this cell cannot absorb this fat droplet, right? So you need to break down these big fat droplets into smaller units, all right? And break them down until they are really small, so they can be absorbed with no difficulty by the cells that line the wall of the small intestine, all right? We use bile to do this, all right? We use bile and some pancreatic enzymes, so for example, pancreatic lipase. A lipase is a molecule that breaks down lipids, right? Pancreatic because it's secreted by the pancreas. Remember that pancreas secretes, the exocrine pancreas secretes pancre uh, pancreatic enzymes that are going to digest many different we have like dozens of these pancreatic enzymes, and each one of the enzymes is specialized in breaking down a particular molecule. So we have pancreatic lipase and bile salts. Their combined action is going to mm, uh, break down these big fat droplets into smaller droplets, and at some point they are so small that we don't even call them droplets, we call them micelles. And now we can absorb this thing. The cells that have no problem absorbing these things because those are nonpolar and they can cross the lipid bilayer using diffusion because they are nonpolar, right? Now, these things are incorporated in the enterocytes, the cells that line the wall of the small intestine, and then they are sent to the lacteals, and I don't know if you remember that, but when we were talking about the structure of the small intestine and the villi, remember this? So there are blood vessels, and there is this green thing that we call the lacteals, which are part actually of the lymphatic system, okay? And what happens is that triglycerides, they're going to go to the lymphatic system. So not to blood vessels directly, but they're going to go to lymph, lymph vessels. So the triglycerides are going to be sent here. And it turns out that the lymph vessels are continuous with blood vessels at some point, okay? So we have lymphatic vessels, um, but eventually all the lymph is going to be 
drain into the blood vessels uh, in a big lymphatic vessel that is located in the, in the left arm here. And this lymphatic vessel is going to discharge all the lymph into a big vein that we have here. So eventually the, lymph, the lymph vessels and the blood vessels, they are connected. So eventually these triglycerides, they are going to end up in the blood vessels. Right? Whenever they are in the blood vessels, then they're gonna get to the adipose tissue, and then the triglycerides, before they get into the adipose tissue, they're gonna be broken down into fatty acids and monoglycerides, and then the fatty acids are gonna go inside, and here, glycerol and fatty acids, they are gonna form triglycerides again, right? The reason why we do this is because glycerol so you have glycerol and fatty acids, you need to break that down into glycerol and fatty acids, and then you need to assemble them again, because glycerol is poor. Yeah. What is the other? The what? The oh, BLDL is, I'm gonna talk about that now. Okay. All right, so you have the absorption of triglycerols, yeah? So they go to lymph vessels, and then they eventually they're gonna get to the blood vessels, they're gonna go to the adipose tissue, and then the triglycerols are going to be stored in the form of fat, right? Remember that glucose can be used as a source of energy, it can be stored in the form of glycogen, but the liver also produces fat, okay? So you can see that we can convert glucose into glycerol, and we can convert glucose into fatty acids, and then the liver has the enzymes to do this, and the liver has also the enzymes to combine the fatty acids and the glycerol into triacylglycerols, into fat, all right? Now, this fat does, does not stain the liver. Sometimes it does. When we have an accumulation of fat, some fat stays in the liver, okay? We call that this uh, fatty liver. you ever eaten uh, foie? Do you know what that is? I've heard it before. Okay. It's terrible. It's uh, the pieces of the liver of ducks and they force ducks to eat a lot. Like with, with funnels even. So they just like, you know this? Yeah. And they force them to eat a lot, so then the liver is forced, basically, to produce fat out of the nutrients, because you are getting so many nutrients, right, that you're not going, the ducks are not going to use anything, so they are going to store everything, and then all the nutrients are, are stored in the form of fat. Then the liver hypertrophies, so this means that liver gets huge and fatty. And then whenever the liver is huge and fatty and everything, then they kill the duck, then they cut the liver in slices, and then you can eat that. And apparently it's delicious, but, you know. Well, so there, in these ducks, there is so much fat accumulated that the adipose tissue cannot keep up getting all this fat, so the fat stays in the liver, okay? And this happens in pretty much all animals too, including humans. So, um, really obese people, they accumulate a lot of fat in the liver, all right? And then they have fatty liver. That creates some problems, obviously. All right, so in normal conditions, though, the, you uh, absorb glucose. The, remember, the glucose goes first to the liver, and in the liver, it can be stored in the form of fat. Now, the liver takes this fat to the adipose tissue, so you can see that the, this fat exits the liver and it goes to the adipose tissue, all right? So the way in which the fat exits the liver is through this thing, VLDL, uh, which means very low density lipoproteins. So this means in English that this is fat, right? And 
the blood, so this fat needs to be transported to the adipose tissue. How are you going to move fat from the liver to the adipose tissue? Using blood vessels, right? That's the way we have to bring stuff from one part to the other of the liver. Do you see any problem with that? Sending fat through blood vessels from one organ to another? Why? Why one water? There is, a, there is a, well, you can make small droplets, right, and send them. But what is the main problem? So what do you carry in your blood vessels? No, what is in your blood vessels? Blood. What's the main component of blood? What's the main component of blood? It's the main component of pretty much everything that we have in the body. Water. Water and water and fat, they don't mix. So you need something that will make fat soluble in blood. So you're gonna have your big lipid droplets and you're gonna add proteins and proteins are soluble in water. So now you can put this into the water and now it's soluble in water or in blood, okay, or in an, any aqueous solution, all right? Now, this is called very low density lipoproteins. So look, lipoproteins, lipolipids, protein, protein, right? Lipoproteins are structures that are made by lipids and proteins, right? Very low density because lipids have a lower density than proteins, right? So this means that the proportion of protein with respect to the lipid is low. <coughs> As a result, these particles, they have a low density, a very low density. We call them very low density lipoproteins because you have LDLs, low density lipoproteins, and um, you have HDLs, high density lipoproteins. High density lipoproteins means that you're gonna have a higher proportion of proteins than lipids, right? Low density lipoproteins, it's going to be kind of intermediate, but the proportion of proteins is going to be lower than here, but higher than here. Very low density lipoproteins. Okay? And this is the way we transport fat from the liver to the adipose tissue. Right? And once the very low density lipoproteins get to the adipose tissue, then they break down, right? So the adipose tissue doesn't want the proteins for anything. So then they break down. The proteins are gone. Then you have the fat here, triglycerols. Before you're gonna break down fatty acids into, or sorry, triglycerols into fatty acids and glycerol, and then you're gonna reassemble everything in the whenever these things are inside the cells. All right. Okay. Questions? All right. That's also mediated by insulin. All right. So insulin controls this process: the absorption of triglycerols and the uptake of fat by the adipose tissue. All right. So we covered glucose, tri fat, and now we have amino acids. That's another thing that we have here that we absorb. Amino acids are absorbed in the small intestine and then they go to the blood vessels, right? And the first place where they go is to the liver again, right? The liver processes all the nutrients except fat before these nutrients are distributed to other places. So you can see that the amino acids get into the liver and here there are a couple of things that you can do. So you can break down amino acids, then you produce ammonium and alpha keto acids, which you, and you can get energy from the alpha keto acids here. Or you can transform the amino acids into fat also, right? Uh, you can send amino acids for synthesis of proteins, particularly to skeletal muscles, but pretty much to all the tissues, right? All, all the cells in the body, they need to synthesize proteins and so 
So to synthesize proteins, you need amino acids. But I want you to pay to, to direct your attention here. So we're going to have amino acids. We can use amino acids as a source of energy, but this in normal conditions, that's not going to happen. So we only get the amount of energy that we get from amino acids in one day is approximately 5% or less than 5%, all right, in normal conditions. If you rely on amino acids to get energy, you are in trouble. This means that you haven't eaten in months. So that you are using the last resource that you have to get energy, okay? But we can use amino acids to produce energy. So the only thing is that we chose not to do it in normal conditions, all right? An interesting thing here is that if you eat a lot of protein, you are going to, oops, okay, battery is over. If you eat a lot of protein, you are going to store the excess of protein into fat. So, you can see that eating an excess of carbs and an excess of proteins results in the storage of these things in fat, right? So we have enzymes in the liver that can convert amino acids into fatty acids, right? And then we're gonna send this fat to the adipose tissue. The liver is gonna do that through uh, BLD, right? Who is regulating this process? here you have a summary of the last few slides. So you can see here that when we secrete insulin, we secrete insulin in response to all these things. So after a meal we have a high concentration of glucose in the blood, a high concentration of fatty acids in the blood, a high concentration of amino acids in the blood, right? Because we absorb that from the small intestine. So we have a high concentration of nutrients, right? And insulin is going to be secreted by the endocrine pancreas in response to this high concentration of nutrients in the blood. And insulin is going to, uh, okay, I erased that already, but anyway. So insulin is going to um, participate in the uptake of all these things. So you can see that you have here a cell from the liver, a cell of the adipose tissue, adipocytes and a skeletal muscle cell, right? So you can see that skeletal muscles, for example, so they take, they, all the cells take glucose, obviously. Now, in skeletal muscles, uh, the uptake of glucose can go to um, use glucose as a source of energy, or the skeletal muscle cells, they can store glucose in the form of glycogen, right? But they cannot store glucose in the form of fat, remember? So that only, that's only being done by the liver. In the liver, the glucose can have like different phase. So we can store glucose into glycogen, we can use glucose as a source of energy in the liver as well, obviously, and uh, we can produce fatty acids out of glucose. And in the adipocytes, the cells of the adipose tissue, you can take glucose and convert it into fatty acids and convert it into fat, and also you can take glucose and use it as a source of energy. Now, in this, in this diagram, the green arrows are estimatory effects. So this means that insulin is going to favor this metabolic pathway. In adipose tissue, for example, glucose can be converted into fatty acids. And since there is a green arrow here, this means that insulin is going to promote the conversion of glucose into fatty acids. And triacylglycerols can be broken down into fatty acids and glycerol, right? But insulin is going to inhibit that metabolic reaction, and this is why these arrows are in red. In the liver, glucose is going to be converted into glycogen, and you can see the green arrows leading to that, right? So this means that insulin is going to stimulate the conversion of glucose into glycogen. It's going to stimulate storage of glycogen. Glucose can be converted into fatty acids, and you can see that there are green arrows here. So this means that insulin 
is stimulating the conversion of glucose into fatty acids. It's stimulating the storage of glucose. Insulin is stimulating the storage of glucose into fat or glycogen. And the reverse is inhibited. So you can see that these things that try go in reverse, so from pyruvate to glucose 6-phosphate, uh, and from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose, that's inhibited by insulin, all right? That would be the breaking down of, well, we cannot convert fatty acids back to glucose. We don't have the enzymes to do that. But we can convert some intermediates back to glucose, all right? And in the skeletal muscles, so you can see that glucose can go, can produce glycogen, and there is a green arrow there. Amino acids can be used to synthesize proteins, and there is a green arrow here. So this means that glucose insulin stimulates the synthesis of proteins and inhibits the breaking down of proteins. All right? So it might seem confusing, but actually it's a summary of pretty much everything that I just talked about today. Right? I don't care if you don't remember. So these are specific metabolic rates, and actually this is very, sorry, metabolic reactions. This is really summarized, actually. So you have like hundreds of molecules, okay, here. So I don't care if you remember the, I don't want you to remember the metabolic pathway. I want to see the big, I want you to see the big picture here. So if you had to summarize what insulin does, looking at this picture, what would you say? In, in, if you have to summarize it in one sentence. What are you going to get from there? No. If you break down glucose, what are you going to get? It's, yeah, if you it's want to break down glucose, it's because you want to produce what? Out of these three things, in which one of those you need to break down glucose? Energy production. Insulin is uh, inhibiting the use of glucose, the breaking down of glucose, and is promoting what? What is gluc what is insulin stimulating here? In the liver, let's take a look at the liver. What is insulin stimulating? So what is so take a look at this here only. What is glucose stimulating? Sorry, insulin. What is insulin stimulating here? Glucose. No, gluc it's not stimulating glucose. It's not stimulating glycogen. What is insulin stimulating here? I don't know. I don't know how to okay. that because I started agreeing. Any, it anyone? Stimulating. So. Gluc insulin, insulin is stimulating the production of glycogen from glucose. Insulin is stimulating the production of fatty acids from glucose. So in one word, in general, insulin is stimulating storage of glucose, storage of energy, right? Because you are gonna use glycogen to store the excess nutrients. Remember the example I put with the money that you get 
every month if you have a job, right? So you get a thousand dollars. You put them in the bank, and you can get like a thousand dollars in in ten bills of a hundred dollars each, right? When you need money, when you need to spend money, you need to break the bill, the, the bill right? So you're gonna pay something that is 50, then you're gonna use a hundred dollar bill, and then they're gonna give you 50 dollars, right? So, but you need to, to break the money into smaller and smaller bins. So, insulin is going to promote the storage of, of glucose, and it's going to inhibit the use of glucose as an energy source, okay? So, these, Inhibits. Breaking down of nutrients. And what are the set of metabolic reactions that are directed towards breaking down nutrients? How do we call those? Catabolism. So in one sentence, you can say insulin. Stimulates what? Stimulates what? Anabolism or catabolism? Stimulates. Anabolism. And inhibits catabolism. That's in one sentence, the summary of the class today. Another way to say that is insulin, insulin is an anabolic hormone. So if you notice all the if you notice all the catabolic reactions are inhibited here, all the anabolic reactions are stimulated here, except in one case, which is in skeletal muscle. But this makes sense because for when we work out and everything, so we need to uptake lots of glucose in skeletal muscles, right? We need to break down glycogen as well. And insulin is uh, promoting this metabolic reaction. But forget about this, this is the exception. So in all the tissues, insulin is promoting anabolic reactions in all of them. And in most tissues, insulin is inhibiting catabolic reactions, all right? So if you are ever in doubt of what insulin is going to do, then just use that that rule. So if, you, if it's a process that is going to break down some molecules, probably insulin is not going to stimulate that. In the opposite is going to inhibit that, all right? Okay? Now the last thing I'm gonna talk about today is how do we regulate insulin secretion? Because all these things happen because we secrete insulin, but we need to regulate the secretion of insulin. We cannot secrete insulin at the wrong time because the consequences that this might have are very important, right? So you have uh, amino acids and glucose in the small intestine, and you have a high concentration of amino acids and a high concentration of glucose in the small intestine after a meal. And we know that insulin is secreted by the endocrine pancreas, right? So what is going to regulate this secretion, okay. So whenever we have a high concentration of amino acids and glucose in the small intestine, we have receptors that are gonna measure that, and these receptors are going to translate this stimulus into an electrical signal, which is going to be sent to the central nervous system, and the central nervous system decides if there is something to do. 
if you have a really high concentration of nutrients in the small intestine, the normal thing is that your central nervous system decides that something needs to be done about it, and this something is absorption of these things and uptake of these things by the cells, right? So the central nervous system can send messages to the parasympathetic or the sympathetic nervous system. So in this case, you are going to activate the parasympathetic nervous system because it's the breast and digest, elicits the breast and digest response, right? So what you are going to do is to stimulate, the, the send messages to the endocrine pancreas via the parasympathetic nervous system. If you send messages via the sympathetic nervous system, that's going to inhibit insulin secretion and this is why you have a red arrow here, right? Okay? Now, when you stimulate the endocrine pancreas using the parasympathetic nervous system, the endocrine pancreas is going to secret insulin. And remember that the small intestine also, in the presence of glucose, secretes this hormone, the glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide, and this is going to stimulate the endocrine pancreas to produce insulin. So you have two ways to tell the endocrine pancreas to secrete insulin in response to the presence of amino acids and glucose in the small intestine and in the blood, okay? When you secrete insulin, what do you think is gonna happen? You are going to decrease the concentration of amino acids and glucose in the blood, right? Because what insulin does is to promote the uptake of these nutrients from the blood vessels. If nutrients are uptaken by the cells, this means that the concentration of these nutrients is lowered in the blood, right? So do you think this is an example of a positive or a negative feedback loop? What's the stimulus here? And what's the response? It more than inhibit, so the response is to secrete insulin, which is going to reduce the concentration of nutrients in the blood. So the response goes with or against the stimulus? Against, so negative, all right? That makes sense, right? Because once you have uptaken all the nutrients that the cells need, why do you need to keep uptaking nutrients? So then insulin secretion is stopped. Questions? I think next week is a fall break and on Thursday and Friday, right? I'm going to post exam two. turn it in on Wednesday, but I think this will give you a very short time to study. Right? So then I think that I'm going to give you the break free, at least for this class. Post exam on Sunday, and then you will have to turn it in before class on Wednesday, correct? I'll send an email uh, explaining all that. Then you have the whole week to study. And next week we're gonna start with a different section. So we are going to start talking about exercise. Okay, and I'll post all the slides and everything today. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Right. So take a look at all the.